this is not one instrument, it's as many instruments as you want it to be. Because of the computing power available now with electronic organs, you can sample a pipe organ anywhere in the world, feed this into the computer memory, and then recreate it here, complete with the acoustic of that particular building. And that means that I can play that piece the way Vidor expected it to be played, because I'm playing it on one of his instruments that he was familiar with, in the acoustic that he was familiar with. It's very important when you play the organ, you don't just play the instrument, but you are playing the building. Just like a guitar has a soundboard and the sound resonates inside the guitar, an organ is inside a building and you have to play the acoustic of that particular building. And if you don't have a familiarity with the building for which the music was written, then you can end up, well, you don't really want to go there if you don't have to. People often play this piece extremely fast because they're used to very dry acoustics in North America. But it's quite a revelation if you get to play it on the instrument and the acoustic for which it was written, you understand why Vidor wrote the slow tempo marking, because it takes time for the sound to resonate. Now there's one huge distinction between pianos and organs. The pianos generally are the same from country to country, and they haven't really changed that much since about the late 19th century. But organs, there are various national schools of instruments, and so the composers in France wrote music that might be very different from what somebody wrote in Germany, because the instruments developed in different fashions. And that's why it becomes ever more important to have access to these different kinds of instruments from different countries, different schools of organ building, and different centuries. Let's go further back in time. And I'd just like to play a little excerpt from a prelude in G major by J.S. Bach. But this time, I'm going to play it on an instrument built by Gottfried Silberman in 1721. And it's in the St. Georgenkirche, in a small village, just a few kilometers outside of Leipzig. And this is an instrument that very likely Bach himself would have played. Now we've gone all the way with this virtual instrument. We've recreated the sound of the blowers, the sound of the trackers. Actually, we haven't really recreated it. It's all just been recorded and, and uh, sampled. So in playing this instrument, I really do get to play that instrument. The building, the instrument, the sound of the trackers, the sound of the wind, everything's there. So here's a sample of that instrument. Temperaments vary from country to country, and it's only in the past hundred years that we've even standardized into pitch. And even there, that's sometimes going higher every year. Um, but what we can do with this instrument is we can not only recreate the tuning of the original instrument, but we can also take different temperaments. And so a student can quickly understand why temperaments evolved and what some of the options were. Here, for instance, is a mean tone tuning that was in use at another instrument. And that, of course, makes use of the wolf tone, the A-flat G-sharp, which some organ builders would solve by having two different keys for the same note. Uh, but any student, you see, this way can load a different temperament and understand quickly what the issues were that eventually led to the development of well-tempered clavier and equal temperament. So once again, here's E major, where the note is a G-sharp. And you can hear the perfect thirds so unfamiliar to us nowadays where we expect vibrations on the third. Now here is the wolf tone. I'm going to pretend this is an A-flat now by playing an A-flat chord. Here's another example of interesting tuning. I'm going to play a short excerpt of a piece by Frescobaldi. He was an early 17th century Italian composer. And I'm going to play it in mean tone tuning, which means that you'll have perfect thirds. It's beautiful sound. And when you get to hear something in mean tone, you can start to understand how resonance could build up in some of these instruments, and perhaps how some of these resonances were actually in the mind of the composer, and perhaps 
led them to write the way that they did. So here's a short excerpt from something by Frescobaldi in mean tone with perfect thirds. Festival in Toronto here this uh, this May 2009 to our technician and marketing uh, manager Daryl Wood, Classic Organ Works. Uh, Classic Organ Works was founded in 1976 by current CEO uh, Henry Wimmenkamp had a vision to create opportunities for the organ through technology and we're very excited about the Hoffert. The, the ultimate of course is a natural pipe organ in a reverberant space, i.e. a you know, gothic cathedral with hard stone surfaces and beautiful reverberations of five or six seconds. And this phenomenal music uh, that you've heard is a result of, of several things. It's a result of what was going through the composer's head at the time. It was a result of that venue and, and it was a result of the builders, uh, a street caveat call who built, you know, like the Steiner Stradivarius of, of instruments. Um, early digital instruments sought to recreate the essence of the organ and, and to a degree were successful. They could sample pipes and create waveforms to replicate pipes, but what they really couldn't grasp was the, the sound of and the presence of being in that space. And with the advent of the virtual organ and powered by Macintosh or uh, PCs, the we're benefiting from billions of dollars in R&D, so we have the engine now to create these wonderful instruments, and they are portable. You can be, they're affordable and purchased in modular uh, fashion, and they're fun to play, as Bill has shown us. So thank you very much on behalf of ClassicOrgon.com, and uh, we'll see you out in the Performing Arts Center.